I would send somebody an email and they wouldn't respond. I couldn't understand why. Because in America, you send an email, they respond. You call people by their first name. You, you know, everything is fine. But then you come to Nigeria and you're working with some people where you send them an email, then you have to walk to their office to let them know you sent them an email. In some extreme cases, you don't have to read the very email that is on their screen for them. Right? Like, I, I, it confuses me when people still do it today when they call me, oh, Adia, I've sent you a love note. I'm like, yes, Outlook notified me. What's this extra phone call? They're like, I just wanted to let you know. So if people are, try, are treating me like that, and I have to reassure them that I, I don't really require that treatment. But it's better to not resist what you see. You have to understand what is required in the context that you are in. Especially if you enter an environment and you're trying to negotiate a deal in such an environment. Many of you here are going to be a business developer. How many people are doing deals here? Okay, I see quite a few hands up, right? So imagine when you're trying to negotiate a deal, right? Like for instance, I just had a meeting with some Japanese people. And my, I had to get off that call and explain to my team how you have to address Japanese people in a certain sequence. You have to start with the Oga first and then go all the way down. You can't say no. If you don't like what they're, they're offering you or pitching to you, you cannot say no in that meeting. Right? So they're, they're completely different cultural norms. Imagine if you go into these meetings as your like, full Nigerian self, brash, loud, direct, you will fail. Okay? So adaptability is key. Next slide, please. So one of the ways to begin to be adaptable is self-awareness, right? So I read a version of this recently and I, I thought it was very apt for this conversation. To be a great operator, you have to raise difficult issues without being difficult to work with. You have to bring up important topics without drawing importance to yourself. You are in charge of getting decisions made, but not making all the decisions. Mm. By the way, take notes if you want to, but I'll post this deck on Twitter, okay? So that you guys will have it. This is for you, I'm not still with the slides, okay? So, it's important that the sooner you learn this, the better. This took me at least a decade to learn, right? Because um, I'm Urobo, I'm from Delta State. Shout out to the people from Delta State in the room. Right? And I grew up in a household where everybody has a strong voice. So, I took my father, the energy of my ancestors, into every meeting. But then, you enter these meetings and then everybody will now, by the time you don't do a 360, somebody will say, ah, this girl, she sucks all the air out of the room. Or I don't like working with her. Or she's too loud. Or she's too direct. Doesn't she know when she's talking to her elders? There's nothing I've not heard. There's nothing. I've even been told I wasn't raised well. And I called my father. I said, well, they sent your home training. They enter. <laughs> and he said, they just want to press your neck. Don't mind them. Right? But this is my strong rule. The father saying this to me. So you have to recognize who you are when you step into a room. One of the things that helped me start realizing this was when I took um, a personality test, maybe 20 years ago now. Right? Um, I did the MBTI test. Who here has taken their MBTI? Okay, good. So I am an ENTJ. And an ENTJ is often described as a commander. So you can imagine when I read my personality test and I was like, yeah, is this how people see me? Right? Now, it's really powerful when you know who you are. Because then you understand your impact on others. But where this becomes really, really powerful is when you understand who you are dealing with. I have a boss that's a completely different, or had a boss that's a completely different personality type. Now, ENTJs are typically big thinkers. His personality type are not. So anytime I'm coming and I'm like waxing on about strategy, let's do this, in two years we'll get this, in five years we'll do this, I was just talking to somebody about thinking 15 years forward. You just look at me and be like, Willy Lee, your head is in the clouds. <laughs> to resent that because I'm like I need I need better feedback than that. But what I realized that his personality type biases him to see the short term in the clearest form. So if you come at him with like long term thinking without the short term thinking, he's gonna think you've missed the point and you are incapable of solving the problem. So when you understand personality types it allows you to sidestep a lot of possible disagreements that make it hard to do your job. So take your test anywhere you see a, a, a personality test.
it. Just take it and start on that journey of understanding who you are. Next, please. Back. You, you skip one. Yeah, there you go. So during the pandemic, um, this was the t in between the time um, I was Amigo and before I joined Thrive. So I didn't have a rule. And of course, everybody was in a, you know, like everybody else, I was in a dark place. You know, I didn't know what the future looked like. And then someone asked me to do a panel. And I agreed, because that was one way to keep busy, right? And then they now asked me, oh, what title should we put? And I was confused, because at that time, I didn't have a job. So I didn't have a title or a company name to put beneath my name. So I said, wait, I'm coming. And then I started thinking about it, and I was like, Jesus. Do I know who I am outside of the context of my employer? And it led me down the road. I started asking some very important questions. So the first thing I did was I went to a fellow builder's LinkedIn who was in a similar situation. Uh, Shani Suleiman, some of you may know him. And I called him and I said, Shani, this is your venture builder and operator. Please, I'm going to just borrow it first. Right? And he was, and, and it opened up a conversation for both of us because we kind of have sabbaticals around the same time that forced us to recognize who we are when we walk into a room as an operator. That represented a massive shift for me. And somewhere in that year, I came up with a phrase that I live by today. And that phrase for me is that I, Adia, design, rebuild or build and scale two-sided tech businesses. And if you look at nearly every job I've had in the last 10 to 15 years, that's exactly what I want to do. So, what is Migo? Vigo connects money to um, borrowers, all right? So it connects people with funds to people who want to borrow funds. What is Thrive? Thrive connects farmers to people who want to buy uh, food, right? What does a telecommunications company do, right? It connects users to each other. So people ask me, how have you made all these transitions? And, and that's it. Right? And, 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 and what you do, and sometimes it takes looking back, it takes talking to people, it takes examining your work, it takes examining the things you do that give you joy for you to figure out your icky guy. Right? So anywhere you see me, you are usually going to see me talking about partnerships, mobile technology, scale, monetization. That's the consistency. Right? So and I can do this anywhere. If I've done it with look, when I went to take over Thrive, I didn't know that Maze and Paul were the same thing. Right? That's how little I knew about the sector. But what I knew was how to build a two-sided business. And that's what Thrive needed. Yeah? So it's important that you start on this journey of asking yourself these questions and understand the kind of problem you solve as an operator. So that then if you now start to recognize the problems that you will make an impact solving, and then by the time you rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, you then have your reputation. Okay, so what I've, all I've done here is repeat exactly the same core set of actions in different places. That's why I'm known for who I'm known to be. Next, please. Okay, so imagine if um, you're at home and you want to order lunch. Right? How many people here use what child deck? Yeah? It's a simple decision, right? Just open your phone, go to your favorite restaurant, order lunch, lunch arrives, you carry on with what you're doing. Very simple situation. Now, imagine you are in Angola and you want to order lunch. Okay, you first think, okay, what's the currency here? What language do they speak? What kind of food do they have? Right? Do they have child deck here? Right? Will they accept my card? Or do I need to pay cash? Right? So imagine doing that every single day. That's the difference between working in a developed market and working in an emerging market. Right? So those of you that are operating here, how many times do you just show up at work and then one katakata has bust? Either for those that are regulated companies, one new regulation has shown up, or something has happened, never took light on one of your platforms, one is just gone. So you are, you are the, the, the difference in working in emerging markets like ours is that you can wake up in the morning and start trying to find your feet. You are not necessarily continuing from exactly where you stopped the previous day, right? So that needs to, that, because of that, right, you need to change the way you fundamentally think. So at any point in time, you need to be thinking a couple of steps ahead. And the only questions you need to really be asking, right, is what if and 
and then what? This is basically the kernel of what's called second order thinking. And what I'm trying to, to express to you guys is that not only is it, is it important for you to be a second order thinker, it is very important for your team to think like that as well. Because for you to be successful, it's not only by your decisions, it's by your team's decisions as well. Right? And I think this needs to be basic in emerging markets simply because you cannot just step outside your house and order lunch. Everything may have changed. Okay? Next slide, please. Talent. So, lots of people complain about Jaguar, um, people leaving, and so on and so forth. But who knows if we did this conference again next year, how many of you are going to be here? But, you know, good luck in all your pursuits. My point here is.
potential in the future with a different job. Okay, next slide, please. Next, next slide, please. All right, so um, this is a framework I use to make sure that I never miss the mark when I'm generating um, revenue. Um, I missed my revenue target once, but once I found this framework, it stopped happening. Okay, so, so imagine that you have to make money from a product, right? There are two types of risk you have to sit down and think about. And as operators, at the end of the day, you are always going to be pushing an initiative towards completion that generates revenue for your organization. Yes or no? Yeah. So, there are two types of things that we need to start thinking about from the beginning. Can your company deliver this product? Does the market want this product? And especially when you are in emerging markets like ours, you have to give yourself and your time and your company time to figure that out. So what that means is, this originally is like a three by three matrix. So with execution risk here, right, you have to give your legal team time to figure out how to draft the contract. You have to give your technical team time to figure out how to, to, to do the code, right? You have to give your marketing team time to figure out how to build a campaign around this product, right? So that's where execution risk. And, and the market risk is, do customers even want it? So this originally is like a three by three matrix, which I've divided into three regions. So low low here reflects cash cows. So for me now in my current role, this is voice revenue, this is very hmm, good data revenue. Anytime, any hour you pitch me, I know exactly how much money we're gonna make. Okay, there's a lot of certainty because we've delivered it, we've been delivering it for years. I know what customers want, I know how many, I know everything I need to know about those products, right? Those are my cash cows. Now, when you start entering the region of, okay, we're not sure um, if customers want it or not, right? This might be maybe larger data bundles, like I'm working on something now, like more bundles that don't expire, right? Mm, we delivered data, data uh, um, revenue before. Uh, sorry, but I'm ignoring that. Uh, <laughs> she wants me to get on the stage, should I do? No! <laughs> so, <laughs> so here, where there's medium risk, medium market risk or medium execution risk, those are things that have deployed and are maybe ready to scale, but I don't really know exactly how much I'm going to make from them. Right? The things with high risk, I have no clue. But we kind of think it's a good idea. We kind of think it's going to help us. and it, it supports our strategy. We kind of think it's the right thing to do. But they're all out there. Now what I do is now decide if I'm supposed to make 100 Naira for the year, right? Or 100 million Naira. 75 million is going to come from the cash cows. 22 million is going to come from the, the uh, ready to scale, right? And then maybe 3 million from the rest. When you start thinking of your pipeline like this, you'll be a lot more comfortable. You'll be a lot more focused. You manage your resources completely differently. So if you wanted me to do, why you take a picture? Next slide, please. I'm almost done, don't worry. Okay, so, um, um, one of the things that we don't do enough of, I remember when I said you need to study the situations you're stepping in as operators. One of the ways to do that is by understanding incentives, right? What makes people think? I know many incentives in this world are financial, but they're not always necessarily financial, right? So, like, why did I get up to do this presentation today? Um, one, this isn't the first time Chris had asked me to do this, so I said no to Chris more than once. And two, um, I don't have enough time in the day to mentor every single operator that asks me. So what this did was create an opportunity for me to clarify my thoughts to start speaking to operators at scale in a way that works for me. That's why even though I have a cold and I'm very uncomfortable now, this was important to me. Okay, so when you walk into a room and you're trying to get somebody to do something, you have to really observe them. Asking them help, but people sometimes don't, they aren't articulate about what they really, really, really want. Right? But you have to observe them and figure out what does this person want and is it something I can align with? Right? Because when you enter a situation with another party and you don't know, you end up in something called the prisoner's dilemma. And a prisoner's dilemma, this is a classic strategy framework where you 
assess what happens when two people agree or disagree. Or if one person agrees first, what happens to the other person? It's called a prisoner's dilemma because let's say two people have committed a crime, right? And the dilemma is who is going to confess first? So the person that, if they, come, if they both decide to keep quiet, right? Let's say you get the medium outcome, which is everybody gets two years in jail, right? But if I confess first and leave you in the lurch, I don't go to jail, you go to jail for five years. Do you understand? So you have to sit down and figure out between the two of you, we have to really understand each other to decide, to, to understand whether we're going to both cooperate, right? Or both, or both confess. Because if we both confess, you know, what's that? If you both confess, both of you will now suffer and both go to jail. Okay? So I've modified it here again. You guys will get the slide to see how this work works with two startups. This works with two departments inside a business, right? This works with anybody that you are interacting with. So if you if you don't know the other person, if you don't trust the other person, if you don't agree with the other person, if you don't know what makes them tick, they can go and make a choice that will screw you over in the future. So do your best to start understanding what makes people take out, take out what their incentives are. Next one, please. I think this is the last slide. Aha! So this is one, this is a special request from Peace. Um, because people keep asking me what it takes to negotiate successfully. And I think we're used to entering negotiations and feeling like you want to come out on top. You want to have beat the other guy. But that, that actually really doesn't work. Those kind of negotiations, you know, they break down after a while. So you may be the other guy, but maybe that person will get up. Right? You want a negotiation that is more win-win, right? And you have to think about mutual gain as well as the perception of fairness. Right? As well as ego. Like, and also the potential for conflict. Like you're not going to go and try and negotiate a deal with somebody that you hate. Right? Or that you are likely to fight with. Right? But in all of these things, the massive multiplier that can get you over the line or really hold you back, more than anything else, is leverage. So people ask me all the time what leverage is. Right? And if you go back to my first couple of slides, I said first it's about self-awareness. Self-awareness for yourself, for your company, so that you know who you are, what you know, and why it's important to the other side. So you have to first have things like proprietary tech, specialized knowledge, better products and services, better culture. You have to have something that the other side needs, right? Then you have to know how to use it. You know, it's like, I'll think of a better example. You have to know how to use your leverage. Like often people will come into my office, like when I was with Etisalat, and say, oh, um, it will make you more data revenue. And I'm like, you don't know the first thing about what I need to generate data revenue, right? Because a lot of startups with no users, no traction, basically no product, who say, oh, we need you to sell this product to your customers, when customers are just chilling, using the 10 megabytes that your product consumes, it will get you more data revenue. I'm like, how? For you to put me in a position where you have users that I want. You have users that buy data consistently every month. Not users that are going to hop from one network to another. Not users that are going to buy one gig today, 100 meg tomorrow. Right? Prove that. And then come and see me. Because at the end of the day, as a telco, I have access to more marketing than you. I already have tens of millions of users. So I don't know what you are bringing to me that you don't understand. But Every single day, startups will show up and say, we'll help you um, drive this. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Try again. I've broken many, many startup founders' hearts by saying that. But again, that just came from a poor understanding of their leverage. But they haven't said that. There are startups I have chased. Right? Because those startups have users that are highly engaged. Do you understand? That use data under all kinds of services that bring, that bring all kinds of circumstances, excuse me, that rely on a connection, a continuous connection. That's what I want. That will come and buy data every month. Right? That aligns specific discounts to longevity on the MTN network or the artisan, whatever network it is. Right? So you have to really do a little bit better than 
the thing you hear everybody saying in the room. This is also where second order thinking comes in. Just go beyond the obvious nonsense. Right? Get deep. Ask questions. Even if you are wrong, I will respect you for trying. But don't come and give me the answer everybody's going to give me. Right? And then, this is the hard part. Right? But I'm here to give you ginger. Don't look desperate. Because the minute you come, like, and your opponent smells weakness, ah, uh, what's the problem? Right? So at least project confidence. Be willing to walk away. Right? Especially when you are a small company working with a big company. The big company will definitely use their leverage against you. So you have to make sure that you have structured your revenue so that the telco is not this, or the big company is not the only road to meeting your revenue target. Okay? They have to be able to walk away, get more traction, right? Look like you've grown and then come back. Right? Because desperation and negotiation never go good together. Okay? Um, next slide, please. Alright, if you've made it this far, well done. I said a lot. Like I said, I will make these slides available for you guys on uh, Twitter and I appreciate you for listening.